Hi everyone, um, very excited to be here today uh, talking about the uh, improvements that we've made in Hive because as probably most of you know, um, here is where the project was started at Facebook already uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, so let me start by providing a little bit of background on why we started this work. Um, so as Hadoop became widely used in uh, enterprise world for inexpensive uh, data storage and, and processing, um, uh, companies wanted to bring more of their workloads into Hadoop, right? And, and one of the workloads that uh, caught a lot of attention was uh, interactive or, or SQL processing uh, in, at, at, at scale. And um, a proof of that is that there were multiple efforts started at the same time to, uh, to be able to execute these workloads within, within the platform. Uh, there were mainly two options. Option one was, okay, let's implement a new system, um, you know, based on existing techniques that have been used in MPP engines. And this is what, for instance, was done, I mean, Cloudera did with uh, Impala, or uh, Facebook did with Presto. Option two was, let's take one existing system um, and let's uh, extend it, for instance, to work well within Hadoop. This is what was done with Hawk. Or what we chose to do with Hive that was already working within uh, Hadoop, well within Hadoop, but we had to uh, broaden uh, the, the use cases that it could cover. So most of you probably know already uh, Hive architecture, but let me go uh, real quick through it. So this is Hive architecture when we started our work. Uh, so if, if we look at the um, left upper side of the figure, you can see that uh, users will connect with their favorite clients, so JDBC, ODBC, uh, Beeline, that is the thin client that is coming uh, with Hive. Uh, they will connect to Hive Server 2 and submit their queries. Hive Server 2 will compile them, uh, parse them and compile them. And it may contact Hive Metastore. It, this is just the data catalog for the, for the cluster. Uh, after it compiles the queries, it will create a DAG of executable tasks that will be submitted to the, uh, to the test um, AM. And you know, this will be responsible to coordinate the execution of the queries, uh, spin up containers, and, and so on. And this, uh, this query may uh, retrieve data from HDFS, object stores, or any other external engine. Um, so now when uh, we started this work, what we did is just you know, asking uh, users and our customers like what were they expecting after we would finish this work, right? And we came up with four requirements that we should meet um, after this, this work was done. First of all, the system should be compliant, uh, meaning that we should, we should support SQL standard and provide asset guarantees that uh, users and applications had relied on for years. It should be efficient, meaning that uh, we should have uh, advanced optimization techniques that um, would let us execute queries uh, efficiently and, and fast. It should be flexible, meaning that it should work reliably uh, across uh, many different use cases, all the way from batch, that was what it was originally doing, to interactive. And finally, it should be extensible. Uh, nowadays, you always have in your class a plethora of um, data processing systems. And uh, for instance, you may have Kafka for stream processing, or you may have Druid or, or Pinot for uh, BI on, on time series data, right? And, and we wanted Hive to be able to push computation into these systems and read data from them. So today, I'm going to be talking about the work that we have done to meet two of these requirements. Uh, I will not have time to cover all of them. Uh, but I encourage, encourage you to find me after the talk if you want to know more about, about our work. So first, let's start with uh, compliance and uh, SQL and, and asset support in Hive. Um, so to provide a little bit of, of background, uh, when Hive was started, you could only have, um, uh, let's say, transactions at the, uh, at the uh, partition level. So you could, for instance, drop partitions or insert new partitions. And, and this was, uh, and then there was some uh, lock manager, right? And this was, posing some pro uh, this, was, this was causing some problems uh, because you could, I mean, a great operation would, for instance, block all the readers. And this is obviously not good when you have a, a system that where the read throughput is, is so important. Uh, another problem would be that, you know, a, a job could fail and then you would get inconsistent results. Uh, because you know, uh, maybe the job was um, 
uh, writing to two different tables, two different partitions, this was not so uncommon. Then it fails, then you don't get consistent reads anymore. Uh, so that's why we implemented ACID compliant record level transactions in Hive. Um, at the SQL level, what this means is that we, ex we can execute insert, update, delete, and merge statements. And how did we do that? Well, we introduced multiversion optimistic concurrency control. Uh, multiversion concurrency control refers to the fact that when a reading, a reading operation comes in, it will get a consistent snapshot of your data, of the data in your cluster. And, and at the lower level, this means that we need to identify each, uh, each record with the transaction that actually growed or committed this record. Uh, optimistic refers to the fact that we try to minimize the uh, locking period or, or the time at which we do conflict resolution. Uh, and one important aspect is the last one, that performance, uh, we wanted performance in, in transactional tables uh, to be comparable to non-transactional tables, and this is something that we accomplished in our last uh, ACID implementation. Uh, so let me deep dive a little bit on, on how we made this work. So on, on one side, you will have the Hive Metastore. Um, we store all the transactional information in the Hive Metastore, and, and this was kind of a straightforward decision because we know that with every Hive deployment, you will have the Hive meta, Metastore next to it, and it will be uh, backed by a relational uh, database management system, right? So it will provide the warranties that we need in order to support asset transactions. So uh, then when uh, a great transaction arrived to a single table, table one, uh, the transaction manager will be responsible to open this transaction. It will get a transaction ID that is uh, increasing, a monoton monotonically increasing number um, global for the system. And then based on this transaction ID and the table where you want to write the data to, uh, you will get a write ID. Uh, we have this duality between transaction ID and write ID because we want to identify quickly whether something has changed in the tables through the write ID. Um, and this is important because we use this information to uh, provide some optimizations on top of the system. So for instance, now we can do in, in Hive, we have a query results cache, which means that you execute one query, and if a follow-up query comes in and it's the same query and the data in your tables has not changed, which is, which is quite common in, in BI tools and so on, um, you will just retrieve it from the cache. You don't have to re-execute your query. So we can do that because we can identify whether something has changed in your, changed in your tables or not. Uh, after you get the write ID, this write ID will be attached to the record writers, um, and, and you will execute your query, and you will commit your transaction. So if we go to the bottom left, uh, you can see how the table layout looks like. So you will have delta or differential directories when you insert your uh, your new records or the records that you are deleting, and each of these folders is identified by its write ID. So that's how we can prevent multiple folders from, step, uh, sorry, multiple writers from stepping uh, into each other. Uh, one thing that I want you to notice also is that we have different folders for insert and delete records, and, I, uh, and the reason will become clear when I explain the, uh, how, how reads are working. And finally, if you look at the bottom right, you will be able to, um, uh, to see how the records actually look like. So assume that in this table we had uh, two columns, first and last name. Then each record will contain an additional column, nested column, a row ID uh, that contains write ID, um, file ID, and a unique identifier of the record within this file. So actually this nested row ID, what it lets you is to identify uniquely every record in the table. And by doing this, we can just model deletes as a record pointing to the record that you are deleting. That's how we model deletes in the system. Now, if we move to, uh, to read transactions, so the workflow is very similar. Uh, when a read query comes in, you will get a snapshot of, of, um, from the Hive Metastore. This snapshot is represented by a transaction ID list, which is simply a high watermark, so the higher, highest allocated transaction ID in the system and a list of exclusions that are uh, transactions that are uh, less than the high watermark and they are still in flight or, or they have not been committed. And, uh, I mean, they have not com been committed because they were aborted or they, they are still in flight and so on. Um, once you get that transaction ID list, you will get the snapshot for the specific table that is the write ID list, and this is what you will attach to your, to your readers so they know which data they need to read. So if we go back to the table contents, and in the example you have a write ID list with high watermark 2 and no exclusions at all. 
uh, the reader from the name of the folders will be able to very quickly filter the, the, delta, the deltas that you need to read. Um, and finally, um, how do we do the consolidation between insert, I mean, between records and deleted records? Uh, what we perform is an anti-semi-join between them. Uh, what this basically means is just keep all the records except the ones that appear in the delete records. Uh, and this, this operation is quite efficient because we can identify the, the delete deltas from the name in the directory, as I mentioned previously. So you can just take these files, ship them through the network, and keep them in memory, and, and it will be, um, it will be quite, quite performant, this consolidation. Now, uh, probably you're thinking, okay, so you just, you know, uh, explain to us these ACID transactions, and, and this will create a lot of small files in the system, and I know that Hive and Hadoop is, is not so, um, so well optimized for, for this scenario. Uh, also, you know, if, if you delete a lot of records, then you will have to read a lot of data that is completely useless. So in order to solve these problems, what we have is a compactor thread that is working in the, or a compactor worker that is um, running in the background. Uh, one important aspect is that this compactor uh, doesn't affect reading or writing operations, and the only thing that it's doing is um, compacting all these delta directories and, and rewriting the contents of, of the table. Um, it can be run automatically, so for instance, periodically, or you can say, okay, when uh, my table has more than a certain threshold of, of uh, files, let's run it. And it can also be run on demand by the user. Um, there are two variants. One is a more lightweight, that is minor compaction, that will only merge the delta directories. Uh, another, the other one is major compaction, that is heavier. Uh, it merges delta, delta files and base directories, but the advantage is that the structure of the, um, of the table, after running it, will be as if no transactions were, were run. Okay, so that was for the first part of the talk. Uh, now let me focus on how did we, um, did we work on flexibility and, and how did we extend Hive in order to go beyond batch processing and, and being able to get uh, interactive, interactive SQL processing in the system. Uh, so we need to improve runtime latency. So to provide a little bit of background, there had been already some improvements that had been introduced in Hive. Uh, so for instance, we had moved away from, uh, from uh, MapReduce and we were using Test, that is a more uh, performant uh, runtime execution engine. We were uh, using columnar storage formats already that had been introduced, such as org. Uh, we had vectorized operators to improve performance. Um, however, if we wanted to reach uh, interactive uh, interactive times, we were still suffering from problems that were inherent to Hive architecture that was tailored towards uh, cluster throughput. Uh, so for instance, the execution of a query would, would require containers allocation, and this would give in a startup time overhead for every query, or the containers had to be killed after uh, the execution of each query, which, uh, for instance, for the Java just-in-time uh, compiler optimizations, it was very bad because they could not be as effective as, as they could otherwise. Um, also, because of this model based on containers, um, it was difficult to exploit, to exploit data sharing and caching, uh, which was leading to unnecessary I.O. overhead. So this all led us to think that, you know, we needed a more uh, radical approach. We needed more radical changes or more fundamental changes in Hive. And that's why we introduced LLP optional layer that comes with Hive and it provides persistent multi-threaded query executors that can run in parallel in your cluster. Uh, optionally, it also provides asynchronous I.O. and multi-tenant in-memory data cache. And, and very important for us, it is uh, compatible with ex existing execution runtime, so we didn't have to re-implement the internals of the whole system. This was very important for us. So now if we go back to the slide uh, about the architecture in, in Hive, what you can see there is that now in, in a subset or all the nodes in your cluster, you, um, you may have these long-running LLP demons. You will have an LLP coordinator that is responsible to monitor the health of these demons, restart them if necessary, and, and so on. And, uh, and now the query coordinators, when a query is executed, instead of submitting the work to the uh, containers or execute them through containers, it will submit the work to each of the demons. 
So how does this work internally? Um, so let's go left to right. So you will have these query coordinators, and then you have these query fragments. Query fragments is just um, one or more operators that are part of a query. It's a work fragment. These fragments enter into a priority queue. Uh, this, uh, this queue is somehow, uh, there is some smartness built in it, so the priorities are set depending on the expected runtime of your query. So for instance, shorter runtime will get higher priority because they are more uh, uh, sensitive to latency. And then you will have multiple executors in parallel that are pulling fragments from this, from this queue. So the executor will just execute this fragment, um, and whenever it is done, it will pull another fragment from the queue. Then on the right-hand side, you have the uh, data caching or, or I.O. layer. Uh, so this is optional. So if you don't run it, when, whenever an executor uh, for a given fragment, whenever it needs data, it will go to HDFS or, or the object store. It will retrieve your data, decompress it if, if necessary, and, and build you know, internal column batches representation and pass it to the, uh, to the, to the executors. Um, if it is, uh, it is enabled, you have a read-through cache. And uh, let me give you a little bit more, more details about this. Um, so the read-through cache, so it's fine-grained and it's compact, uh, meaning fine-grained, meaning that you will only keep a, in, the, in the daemon the columns and rows that are being accessed, not the full files that you are retrieving from HDFS. Um, data is, and it's compact because data is stored uh, encoded to minimize the memory footprint within the daemon. Uh, it supports most common file formats. So for instance, if you are using something optimized like org, it is cool because the cache is layered, so it can, for instance, store information about your indexes of your stripes, and it, could, uh, it can basically skip reading this, this uh, stripe from the file system directly. But if you use something like a text file, uh, you can still benefit from the cache. It's just that the first query will pay probably a higher price, and then you know you will retrieve your data just from the uh, from the encoded data in the in the cache. Um, it is incremental, meaning that adding new data to your table does not invalidate the cache. So we identify each of the files uniquely with a file ID, and and we can do that. And this is very important because if you link it back to ACID, this allows us to grow or to um, to incrementally uh, create this cache instead of just wiping all, all the data whenever there are changes in our base tables. And it has a pluggable replacement policy, so there is a LRF, LRFU uh, hybrid uh, policy by default that is a, a, li a little bit better than LRU when you have, for instance, queries that are reading a lot of data, and they, might basically, they may basically um, uh, wipe the contents of your, of, of your whole cache otherwise. And finally, another important aspect in, in the system was uh, multi-tenant deployment. So, okay, what are you going to do when you have uh, multiple queries, multiple users uh, running queries at the same time in parallel? So a lot of the benefits in the system in these deployments, they come from how LLP daemons are architected, right? You will have this multi-tenant uh, caching layer that all the queries can benefit and all the users can benefit from. Uh, but we also build some, some other stuff. So for instance, there is fragment preemption based on the state or, or priority. So uh, what this means is that you have a work fragment and they are execution maybe pipeline for some of them. So before all the inputs are ready, you may start pulling data, but maybe at the same time, some other fragment with higher priority will arrive. So you will, or, or LLP will be able to preempt the first fragment, execute the second one, and then whenever it's done, it will continue with the execution of the, of the first one. And it also, we also uh, built a workload manager. This is something that you've probably seen in other warehouses solutions uh, that lets you define plans to share uh, the cluster resources, so it will help you to meet your SLAs. Uh, you can say, okay, I have my resources in the cluster. I want to assign 80% to this pool that is for this specific application or these specific users, and I want to use this other 10% for this other application or other users. And you can also define policies uh, that are uh, resource-based guardrail policies, meaning, uh, you know, uh, if a query is uh, using, for instance, more than a certain threshold of, of memory, just kill it or move it to another pool. And this is, um, this is useful so, you know, one query cannot derail all the other queries in your cluster that are being executed at the same time. 
All right, uh, so that was, I think, quite a lot. Um, so let me uh, conclude and talk a little bit about what's next in, in Hive. Um, so as, as you probably realize, we believe that Hive's architecture and design principles have proven to be powerful in today's analytic landscape. Uh, the work done by, by the community has taken Hive a step closer to other existing MPP database engines. So it is just mind-blowing to see what, what our customers and are nowadays doing with, with Hive. It was just unthinkable like two years ago, right? Uh, you have thousands of analysts running sub-second uh, uh, qu uh, average latency queries on one petabyte of data, or you have 250,000 BI queries per hour running another cluster. So that's just, just amazing, right? Um, and but we are going to continue working on, on these four axes, and we have future improvements to do in, in all of them. So, for instance, for compliance, we are working on um, we are working on multi stemming transactions. This is something that is happening right now. Uh, for efficiency. Uh, we introduced materialized views in Hive recently and automatic rewriting. So we are working, for instance, on uh, how to give better recommendations depending on your workload. So, you know, what should you materialize, how you should partition uh, these new materializations, and, and so on. Um, flexibility. So we are continue, we, we continue, or we continue working on improving the uh, runtime latency and making the system better as an interactive SQL engine. Uh, so there is work going on on, for instance, these uh, 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 eviction uh, policies in the cache, so how to uh, tailor them towards specific workloads and so on. And finally, about extensibility. Uh, so there are quite a bit of, uh, there is quite a bit of work there, but one of the, um, one of the main things uh, that, uh, that we are working on is uh, integration with Kafka. Uh, and you know, trying to run queries as soon as the data is is available in the in the whole system. And one more thing before I'm leaving, um, something that we are very excited about at Cloudera, and we've been working on. Uh, so you know, we've done a lot of work to move Hive all the way from batch to interactive, and and we think that the system as it is today can thrive in other environments. So that's why we are working on Hive in the cloud. Uh, on Kubernetes, so you can see in the picture that there is no Yarn cluster there. Uh, what you will have is long-running Kubernetes clusters with your uh, share uh, with your data plane services and shared services like Metastore for your data catalog or Ranger for security and authorization and so on. And then what the user can do is spin up ephemeral uh, clusters with uh, Hive Server 2 endpoint and your LLP demos, and they can start automatically submitting queries to, uh, to the system. And this is um, it's quite cool. There is quite a lot of uh, work going on. We can have multiple versions of Hive running at the same time in the cluster. You can do things like rolling upgrades. Uh, there is work going on for auto-scaling or shutting down resources when they are not needed anymore. And, and, and there is a lot of work going on. So um, I hope you'll hear about this uh, uh, much more uh, soon. And uh, yeah, before finishing, I just want to thank all the, the team, uh, Hive community and Hive team at Cloudera, formerly Hortonworks, because, yeah, this is the work of a lot of people, not a single person. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And uh, thank you very much. I'll be taking questions.